introduce the man, the legend, the doesn't shut up Graham Tennick. Is that about fair? Um, the not shut up part, yeah. The bit beforehand, <laughs> I, I had to pay for that part. So that's open to debate. So I mean, that bit, we'll see. I'll so, let um, the judge. Graham founded Tenic Accountants in 2012. He initially spent five years training in, in, in small accountancy practice before moving on to senior roles with Price PwC and the public sector. Now, if you've spent any time with Graham, you'll hear about him and his dad and the fact as a teenager, he spent many of his Saturdays and probably a lot of his Sundays knowing him washing forklift trucks in the business. If that's not preparation for an accountancy, I have no idea what is. Um, and as you'll find, um, there's going to be nothing off limits in this discussion. Great. I, you know, I put some stuff up and Graham and I was like, oh, is that a bit sensitive? Graham goes, no, no, that's fine. We can be really open about my story. So he's been on a real roller coaster um, with his journey from intense highs to intense lows. You know, along the way, I think it's fair to say, Graham, you finally cracked it or you hope you cracked it. Um, and you now know what you want from your practice, where it's going and how your firm helps clients. So, Graham, why don't you just tell us, give us a little bit of a positive history of the growth of your practice? Well, just to start off with, when I started this business journey, I had Heather's hair. It was literally <laughs> that long. And literally, uh, this is what happens. <laughs> um, so, Whistle Stop Tour. Um, so, yes, it was back 2012. Uh, left a well-paid job. Had been offered even better paid job. Um, and the big mistake I made at that point there was I replicated the firm, which I'd been trained in. Um, now, at that stage, the cloud was still relatively new, um, a lot newer than what it is there now. So I'd spent the first five or so years just replicating that same firm, doing things manually, using sales line 50. Um, but I've been fortunate enough, because I'd run the business on a shoestring, I'd kind of got away with things. But as the business progressed, obviously, I rewarded staff members as I recruited, then margins started shrinking. Now, at that stage there, I was like, right, OK, I went away skiing and came back. And then we'd lost our biggest client. Our biggest client at that time was paying two hundred and fifty pound plus VAT a month, um, and it was because we didn't speak German because we're owned by a German company. Um, and I was like, right, I need to kind of get things into shape here. We need to kind of adopt this cloud thing that people are talking about. So we thought, right, let's do the zero on Sage path. We'll go down that. Introduce Dext. Um, I made this then secretary redundant, um, and I automated her job role within about six weeks. And I thought, oh, I wanted something here with regards to technology. But at that point there, things were going good and I found some efficiencies and again, restored some um, what would prove to be diminishing profitability to growing profitability. When the wheels come off, because the term I use and everybody associates with me is I went to ZeroCon 2017 maybe, and I went and got software drunk. Um, I fell in love with glitzy, glamorous, um, I don't mind mention it, it was the Futurely um, guys. I fell in love with their report. I thought, right, I'm going to do advisory. Back at the office, Ben, we hadn't long since went down the Sage and Zero route and Dext. And um, I was like, we're doing advisory. We're going to do this, blah, 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 blah. I'd committed to 50 licenses because it works out cheaper per license. All accountant mindset and common sense have just eroded at that stage. It's just like, just buy five. Um, and I committed to loads of different stuff. Didn't have the right structure. Didn't have the right process or team, anything. Um, and then when I spent the fourth on software to then found things stagnated. Quite considerably stagnated. Um, and I was like, this is just a little bit crazy. I then, at this point here, um, Heather will tell us to shut up in a minute because this is where I warned her before. So I'm going to go across the whole agenda probably in the first <laughs> minute and then you can come back to it. At this point here, I then thought, right, I've now got software drunk. I've recognised some of the errors of my ways. Let's dig a little bit deeper. So I'm starting to read the books a little bit more in terms of the business books a lot more regularly. We did an exercise with Myers-Briggs and I started to understand the mentality switch I needed to kind of flip. I thought, right, there needs to be a change with regards to the processes and things around that. <clears throat> so we then committed to clarity and that changed everything in our business. This was around about no, August, September 2019. Yeah. And we had our second best year for the year ended 31st of March 2020. Um, and we were ready um, and equipped to go forth with the advisory piece. And towards the latter stages of 2020, we got awarded the UK Digital Account of the Year. So we actually embraced technology, got it working right, focused on the right sort of stuff. But COVID had hit and we pulled a little bit back with regards to that whole advisory piece to the point whereby the wheels significantly come off uh, with <laughs> several different things in the business. 
over the course of the year on 31st of March 21 to find out that was our worst year we'd ever had. And then I, and I, I'll just touch upon this because I know we're going to dig in all these parts in more detail. Then I thought, right, I need to take this all apart, rebuild it. And I did that over the year and think just about 2022 to again have a record year. So from a worst to a best in 12 months. And now finally we feel like we've got, pardon the pun, clarity. Um, we've got a significantly better and stronger foundation to grow our business. Um, and COVID, ignoring the health sort of side of things, could never have been a better thing for us in our business yeah. because it's accelerated the lessons we've learned. We've probably learned 10 years worth of lessons, you know, 15, 18 months. Yeah. And, and, and I think probably people haven't realised that what they... What they've actually heard in that was that you went from your best year to a year when you burnt through cash and a bounce back loan because you needed to restructure the business, sort it out, sort out a massive monthly cash flow hole of which have put people out of business. We're not talking, a oh, I'm breaking even each month. This isn't good enough type stuff to then, you know, conversations, literally taking doing the hard yards, the hard decisions and rebuilding it team member by team member, client by client. And, and I remember a distinct conversation you and I had. It was around about, it was around about December 2022. And, and, and you were, you, you were, your face was everywhere, wasn't it? Across the profession. You'd literally yeah. become the poster boy for the profession. And it was obviously, how do I put it? A photo taken of you with a good light, because you look great in that photo, by the way. What would you mean, good light? Good light. <laughs> good light. <laughs> and, 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 and I turned around to you and I said, you've, become the one that turns up for all these software houses talks about how great their product is but you've loved, loved you know your eyes come off the ball with your own business you're like yeah right um and so you know what was it that you did to actually turn around that business from that sort of 2020 2021 omg moment you know how did what did you do how did you actually go from you know a business that was well, really going bankrupt to a business that was nice and growing again. What did you do? What were the things you did about? Yeah, well, rolling back a little bit, back when we won the digital, UK Digital Account of the Year, that was like a, a breakthrough moment for us. And that worked in two very distinctive ways for us. It worked extremely well because it gave us a profile for which to say was great for building our platform and to understand the technology side of things. And get involved with some very, very um, well-respected people that really structure our business in a better way. However, I also allowed it to work negatively in another way because it raised our profile amongst the software companies. I don't mind admitting my ego got a little bit in the way because all of a sudden it was nice to be asked to be on webinars. I mean, over the year 2020, I did about 50 webinars. Um, and again, it was partially ego-driven. I quite like speaking at events because I can't talk. Um, and I really oh, enjoy it. I didn't know you could talk. I'm having to force the words out of your mouth here. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling for words. I, I just, but, but yeah, it was partially ego driven. And as accountants, we usually fall in the background. So it's actually quite nice to come to the forefront. Now, what ended up happening is I did a bit of a, we're doing all this. And I was like, right, okay, we need to take a step back here because we've given loads of support. And I'm, I'm still proud to say we only lost one client due to COVID and they were already going down the pan anyway with regards to things. But we'd given so much support to our clients and external software companies. I did have a long-term forecast. I was like, if we continue as we are um, and nothing changes, we will potentially be bankrupt within about two years. Mm. We would literally would just run out of cash in terms of it. Um, so we kind of keep going down the path. So once it wasn't imminent, it was something where I can see the runway with regards to this. Um, and like, I want to act there now. So what I actually did, well, actually, before I tell you what I did, there was a couple of other things happened, which I think is important um, speaking of. Um, it was December, sorry, it was January 2021. Um, sorry, it was December 2021. The last working day before Christmas, one of our team members handed me his notice. I was like, all right, okay, why is this? And in short, they disagreed with us having a, an offshore team. Um, and again, if anything, it was because it, it showed their flaws. And I said, well, will you stick with it till the end of January? They said no. And I said, well, where are you going to mistake? But okay, that's fine. We then come back the first day, working day of um, January 2021, um, busiest month of the year. Um, I then get a phone call off one team member saying um, their mom's test positive for COVID, so they won't be in. I said, not a problem, just like take care. I then got a phone call off um, some, I won't mention any specific reference to team members because this is quite a, an issue with regards to things. Um, but it's, we've got a phone call off uh, family members um, 
fiance to say that person's um, or a close relative had committed suicide. And this was in January 2021. Now, at this stage here, bearing in mind all of the stress and everything with regards to COVID, didn't even come close to what that individual would have been feeling at that time. I then took a step back and I took a big, deep breath. And I'm quite a mentally resilient person. Um, bearing in mind we'd already experienced two suicides with Clydes before then, so this was the third instance. Um, and those two Clydes that committed suicide were not in the sort of failing businesses that were actually doing okay. So I took a deep breath. I was like, we need to get rock together here. So I gathered the senior members of the team and I said, look, guys, this is what's happened. Um, we need to come together. I know with everything which is going on, but excuses won't kind of wash here. We've got a job to do what our clients expect us to do this job to get these tax returns done. And the team said, what do you want from me? What extra hours do you want us to work? And let's get this done. And I said, right, we've got the platform to do it. Now's the time to use the platform and do it this way, blah, blah, blah. And we nailed January 2021. It's probably been the proudest month of my business for how the team come together. What we did then was nothing short of phenomenal. Mm. Um, we nailed all the tax returns. Frustratingly to find two days before the deadline, I extended another month, but we said, I don't care. We're going to run with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we nailed it and then in February 2021 um, that individual came back and I just said look it's horrible what's happened but you two have been struggling we need to find a way forward with regards to this I said you can stay here but I'm changing your job role I'll protect your salary you can find a job elsewhere for which I'll fully support you or you can set up on your own and again I'll support you doing that so at this point here I then started realizing I needed to manage people's mental health themselves as well as mine as well as the businesses and we then managed the team down to a number and the personality trait which suited the growth of our business. Mm. So from COVID, the midst of COVID, the height of COVID, we went from 15 staff to 10 staff, which was around April, May of 2021. And we just went boom after that. When we got the right team working the right way, so we had the people right, we had the process right, we had the technology and data, we flew and we properly took off with regards to that because we went back to doing things in such a structured and streamlined way things just took off but and again we're going to come back to different bits of this life is very much a roller coaster in terms of things I don't sit here now saying I've nailed it never can replicate my model they can it because I'm changing my model not daily because there's certain things I've done which I know Heather's going to quiz us about but this is a permanent evolution with regards to things but I've learned like I'm not exaggerating probably 10 years with the life lessons in a 15 80 month span but which is if from May 21 we've become a totally different business and one mm. which I wish I'd started off in that way. And and yeah, it was almost it's almost like you set up with the whole, as you said to me, you said, I can't believe I've gone and done this. I've gone and built a traditional firm swearing that I never would. And then you had to rebuild everything. And then you went ahead with this, hey, we we're a newfangled advisory firm, but not on stable basis. Then you needed to rebuild everything. But I wanted to pick up a point there that um you kind of you you sort of glossed over a bit but actually you can't scale a firm unless you've got a solid foundation of people that share your vision and you know and that that January when you brought the team together was that point where the vision started to go between the team and you got pride and you started to move forward um but it was off you know and I, I spoke to you many times in that period and it, it wasn't you know I think the word is the British understatement. It wasn't fun. <laughs> Mastering I'd the like to say something different, but because it's been recorded, I won't put it. It starts with S and ends with a T. Yeah, it's got H I in the middle, hasn't it? Hi. Yep. <laughs> How did you find that inner strength? Because, it, you know, as you said, it was the brown pants stuff. It was the stuff that no business owner should ever need to do. It was knowing that some of your clients had committed suicide. It was hearing how tough life was and hitting you from every angle. How did you find that inner strength to kind of go, right, let's sort it out again? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and I think it's probably come from my upbringing um, mm. in terms of that. Um, and you touched upon it there before. I come from a, a business background. My dad set up um, a Ford truck business um, prior to me being born. So I've always been around fellow business owners and I know the struggles, I know the strains that relate to them firsthand with regards to things. But my dad is one of the most resilient, ambitious little buggers out there. <laughs> and it's just literally in my blood with regards to things. Um, I don't give up on anything. Uh, and it's something that could be a downfall as much as it can be a good thing. But sometimes I do hold things in and I don't kind of let them out as much as I possibly should do. But I learned to gradually do that with the right sort of people at the right time as things developed. And that clarity with peace and the and the controlling nature of things, because again, as much as people say, oh, yeah, dead was a this, that, 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 
resilience can be as much as a good thing as what it is a bad thing because sometimes you'd be overly resilient to the point where I look you just need to show that vulnerability piece and actually there's some help there for you to actually kind of say hey guys look I'm not I'm not bulletproof with regards to this I do need some help um, and like you say when I recognize it's like right we've got no other option that calmness in kind of a, a state of chaos probably come from decades of being in our own business so on as let's say my family upbringing in terms of things around that my dad ran a successful business, sold a successful business, but it wasn't always a successful business. I've been on other people know the stresses and strains with regards to that. Things you go through a personal perspective along with family members and things like that. There's lots of different things which happen along the way, which give you that added level of experience. Um, and again, you, you then start relating, and I don't like to compare, but and I don't also like to kind of like talk down, but I see the struggles of other people thinking, oh, it is. I'm so lucky in life. I'm so lucky because I'm married. I've got two healthy kids. Family is in good health. Um, I can touch with obviously enough when I see all of this. But I recognize um, what I do have rather than what I don't have. Um, and Paul Miller, who's also a part of the group, um, recommended rec rec a book to me not so long ago as it happens um, called Life in Half a Second. I couldn't tell you the author, but it's actually downstairs. And a brilliant, brilliant book that made you appreciate life. But the likes of support me yourself, Heather, from Paul Miller, Paul Dono, Gareth Burton, other guys in the club, it just really helped kind of bring things together. Um, and all of a sudden, and I think this is a critical message I'd like everybody to take off this call, I can I started controlling the speed of change. Mm. And I think that's a fundamental thing there because I've been flying by the seat of me pants. At one stage, I've been lying down because I wasn't doing the cloud stuff to fly by the seat of me pants to then being controlled by anybody and everybody apart from me. So that was a case of, hang on a minute, no. I've got to work on the 1% marginal gain approach and I'm going to grow to be comfortable in that space. So as much as I'm ambitious and I want to get over there like yesterday, it's like, you know what it is? If we go as a team and we go in a structured collective way, we'll only get there quicker, but we'll also get further. And that's been a several steps along the way, but control the speed of change and don't have it be controlled by others around you will be a massive lesson I would love for people to take away. Mm. And it's so true. Um you know, my good friend Trisha, if I had a business mentor, would be the one that's inspired me. She's five years ahead. And she said to me in my very early days as a business owner, she said, it's you that control the pace of this. If you want to press the accelerator down harder, you do that. But it's you that control that pace. And I think it's a really important lesson. And there, you know, one of the things that I just that I really related to, you and me are both very resilient, aren't we? we we're like, OK, right. Silver lining. What is it? Find it. Move on. Whatever. And interestingly, my coach said to me these last couple of weeks, she said, stop rationalizing what's happened to you. Stop putting logic there. Actually feel it for a while. She said, because otherwise you're just repressing it. And it's so important, isn't it, to not just not just kind of bottle it up and go, been there, done that. It's a story. I'll move on. You've actually got to allow those feelings out. You, you know, it really helps to reach out to that support network. And I know you've got your growth specialist. You, you know, you take, you tried out quite a few of us now in the club. <laughs> you've got the lovely Yasmin now helping you with marketing. But, it, it, but there's a really interesting point here is that it's not just your growth specialist, but it, it's also, I know you're regular at the book club. I know, you know, using that. And that neatly brings me on to like the segue. I hope you're impressed about this segue on to by the way to listeners if you've got a question to ask Graham put it in the chat box because I'm telling you he'd love to answer it it's going to screw my timings up but it helps him win the bet <laughs> I'm going to go for that 30 minutes guaranteed <laughs> so I remember a lot of conversations with you that yes I, I, I'm, I'm doing this whole business support this business growth service and you had that vision right back before COVID that it was about helping these growing businesses but I think it's fair to say that Back in early, well, before 2020, it was a little bit vague what that meant. You know, you you, you really needed to have really a, a a government gateway. You were in your target market, weren't you? Account, you know, it wasn't. So I know you've spent a lot of time in the last 12, 24 months working out what Tenic Accountant stands for, who you wanted your clients. So this wasn't just about establishing your brand externally. It was also internally. So what steps did you do? What did you, what did you do to get that strong values and culture internally, but also replicate the external messages to get the right clients coming to you. Sorry, I've got hiccups. Well, can we talk about the, you forced me to retire a key member of our team. Can we mention that as well? 
Yeah, you can talk about whatever you like because you're going to anyway because you're stubborn as a mule. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Well, like you, like I said, we're both alike. So there was a key member of our team, one of the most famous members of our team, and Heather had me retire them. <laughs> you're not telling me that I'm telling you to retire and get rid of team members again. No, no, you did, you did. The poor old, world famous, world renowned Golden Duck. Oh God, I did I guess. Yeah. So yeah. on a serious note, this does tie a little bit back to this. We had a breakout session as part of the um, the growth advisor session, part of the breakout session in, in London, um, a group of us. Um, and again, the Golden Duck came about as a result of zero card, and I want to kind of boost our nine presence. The Golden Duck, the whole idea of it was every Friday member of the team would be awarded the Golden Duck who made the greatest contribution for that week. Um, and everybody knew of it. It was actually good to an extent in terms of raising the profile of the company, but it just raised the profile of the company in no specific way. So it had become redundant as such. So we did that session, and on walking back to the station, I made the Golden Duck redundant, and it was one of the most liked posts that I actually shared, and I was just quite worrying. <laughs> um, but that same session, you pulled me on this, and it was brilliant. It's one of the best things ever pulled me on. It took me 10 years to establish our niche. <clears throat> and it really paid me off the fact it took me that long. But the problem is everybody's really, you should establish niche, blah, blah, blah. Very rarely do people actually kind of tell you how to. Second of all, which obviously you did tell me how to, second of all, hold it account in terms of doing it. So what I did is when I'd actually established that, I actually established what we weren't and that helped me establish what we were. So mm -hmm. actually reverse engineer it. If anybody's still struggling with it, I, I stress enormously get an Excel spreadsheet, list all your existing clients down, and just say categorize them in terms of understand what you've actually got. And you'll first determine what you're not to then help you understand what you are. Once I did that, I was like, right, okay, I can start seeing some of the pieces start to come together here. So I'm going to share that with the team. Share it with the team, got a bit of insight off the back of them. And I thought, right, okay, have we actually ever established our vision? There's all these ideas usually in my head. Have we actually established our vision? I thought, well, haven't. So there's a book called Vivid Vision. Was yes. it a book club? Um, oh, about nine there. months ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was quite a while ago. Um, I can't remember who wrote it, but I, I read Vivid Vision. Um, and when I was down at Account X, and again, this shows I did learn my lesson, I was down at Account X for two days. And then one of the days that I'm not actually going for half the day, I'm going to finish off being this good, I'm going to finish writing our vision. So I wrote our vision out, which then tied back to our niche, which then tied back to our values, because we also did a breakout session on our values. So all of a sudden, I had my values built, I had my niche built, I had my vision built, which I then incorporated amongst the team, built that into their actual appraisals so they're aware. They've got feedback from across the whole way. And I was like, well, I've actually got something here which makes sense, and everything's singing and dance on the same hymn sheet, which we're now going to share with clients, which we shared at our client awards, which we did there this year. And uh, we then got videos and everything. It's been like a domino impact then for the marketing, which again further reinforced where we were last year. And it's just again been a brilliant thing. It's like actually, you know, it's, I feel like we know who we are, the team know who we are, the clients know who we are, potential clients should soon enough know who we are by way of the things we're pushing out there. So it's been like a domino impact of da, 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 but making sure that consistency is there, but involving the team every step of the way and clients. We've got some feedback of clients along the way as well. But again, it's a case of building blocks and doing it slowly rather than just pushing forth with what the press may have you to believe or, dare I say it, um, what other accountants may have you believe. And I mean that politely because, again, you can often be led by the accountants. I need to be doing this, this, and this. Be led by yourself. Mm. And, and, I, and I just want to unpick this a little bit. So, um, you know, part of the work you did was bringing the team together around a core set of values. And what that did, that core set of values, linked to your vision and so what you did was you got the internal brand right because ultimately you can go out to the marketplace and we're going and go we're amazing but if the internal brand and how you work together and the principles of how you work together does not match or is inconsistently applied you'll start to damage you know I just had a conversation today about oh we're not getting the service right we've seen a reduction in referrals and we we and I'm not going to say what happened but it was about a value had started to become inconsistently lived within the business and it needed to be worked through so you did that values work I know we run a what we like to call our flagship program uh, we run the certified growth advisor program which is a six-month program for our members who've typically been with us for over nine months they've done all the basics 
they're they're over 250 and i know people that have done this program graham uh describe it as transformational oh my, my team want to do it um, and it was a brilliant thing from a coaching perspective because again i think there's a number of skill sets which the club gives you but you wouldn't come to the club ordinarily for and that coaching bit has been massive for me and like you say there's members of my team are desperate to do coaching <laughs> Talk to me quietly. I'll run a program for you. Okay, no Thank you. <laughs> so, so, and it, interestingly, that that program led led to a lot of deeper connections within members on it. You know, we run it every year, um, and I remember sitting down there, and 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 people said, "You don't have a brand, Graham, yet in the marketplace." Because you're like, "How do I put this marketing on autopilot?" And go, "Your messages are wrong," which is partly why I shot the golden duck. Um, but but you know, there there was a it was really interesting because you're like, I've got my niche. And I said, well, your website doesn't say you've got a niche. And yeah. you're like, oh, yeah, you're right. So I remember you literally rewrote your website a couple of times. And a couple of times I said, it's still not right. It's still not a niche. And, and I think you've done what a lot of people do where you go, this is who we want. You know, you wanted growing businesses. I know you work with a lot of small professional services business. You work you work with some mucky businesses, you yeah, know, literally, manufacturing yeah. heartland, um, you know, and and. The, the reality was that you got that stuck up on a piece of paper, but that hadn't translated into your offering yet, hadn't translated into your marketing messages yet. And you'll be pleased to know that somebody that you value very highly is coming up to Newcastle. It says, I'm rather jealous of Graham's social media messages. I think he's absolutely crushing it. I want that to PD? be that good. And, and, you know, just just you know how much is your practice growing at the moment as a result of getting that internal brand aligned with that external brand aligned with the what you're doing you know you you said at one point that your biggest client in the early days was 250 pounds a month tell us what's your biggest client now what's your average new client give us the numbers give us the facts yeah uh, oh that's a very good question um i would say our average fee now is around the 250 plus back per month our yep. biggest client is paying us for about two grand a month plus that. Oh, nice. So yep. um, our new clients we're taking on rarely are below the five hundred pound plus VAT a month. Um, I say rarely. We are not doing tax return only work. Um, but some of the quotes we've got out there at the minute, we're pushing in excess of two two thousand pound plus VAT per month. But that's our top package. But usually, you see, we're kind of floating around the, the five hundred pound plus VAT upwards a month. Um, that's where we're targeting. Uh, we actually, in terms of the number of clients we take on, we're actually taking on less than what we've ever taken on, but we're taking on better quality. So what we did is when we stripped everything back, the team, not me, the team had come back and said, actually, we think we've got an extra 150 grand worth of capacity. So bearing in mind, rolling back a couple of bit, went from 15 staff to 10 staff, grew our sales, and about 30 grand to our bottom line, and created 150,000 pounds of the spare capacity. But, and again, this is painful for me saying this, a, because my personality traits in terms of being impatient and B, being an accountant, I didn't rush to fill it. And that's the one thing, because there was loads of work we could have taken on. I was like, no, if it's not right, I'm not having it. And there's other work we've got, I was like, I'm just going to get rid of it. Even though it might mean things are a little bit tight for a minute, mm. I'm yeah. going to kind of, I'm going to pull back and I'm going to kind of just, just get rid of it. But just going back to point you saying, folks, I've got to kind of make men mention of her as well. Um, we got shortlisted for the Accountant Excellence Awards um, in September of this year. Um, and Lorna was there as well because she was also up for a couple of awards and she pulled us then reference our niche she says Graham I'll be honest you still come across a little bit like Stephen Bartlett in terms of some of the things doing on your niche you still need to do this is now a bit more practical feel and I love Lorna Lorna joined the club at some time to me and um, she was at the same session as me down in London so we actually joined together um, but again I've got to kind of speak out again about the club and about specific in there the fact that Lorna would do that and just pull us up for it um, and I said, I'm so pleased you said that, but it resonated a couple more things too, is just to kind of push that message through. And I think this is where the whole resilience bit and the, the comprehensive bit to get to those sort of numbers comes from the wider piece within the club. It's such a powerful, it feels like promote the club, but I'm just having an honest kind of chat here. Mm. But he said, buy those bits there, can I hold it to account? But that's where you get to these figures. And then there now, it's just like I say, it's like, yeah, this is good, but this isn't good enough. We want more. We want to be doing this. We want to be doing that. And again, you just keep pushing the bar, keep pushing the bar, mm -hmm. but then not allowing it to slip because you've got the foundations around you and that added responsibility you give to team members to say, no, that's crap, you're not doing that. And it's really interesting that, you know, you dropped some figures there that at one point your biggest client was paying you 250 a month. 
yeah. you've had a massive work to re-engineer um you know your practice so now your average fee is 250 pounds a month yeah. and you're taking on clients are typically for more you know most clients that come through the door are now 500 quid a month or more and your yeah. biggest client is two grand a month yeah so yeah in terms of in terms of in terms of growth of your practice i know that you've had false dawns yeah so what you turn over now and how what speed are we growing because i get the impression you're probably adding on two to three clients every month but they're the well, 500 to a grand a month type clients yeah so on average it's two to three clients a month um, our record month in terms of leads whereby i pretty much led the meetings with i think 28 and um, that did all lead to conversions um but we have a goal of we want to be a million pounds within three years to another that, that's where we want to be and at the minute we're going for about the 400 to 500k mark by the back end of next calendar year hmm. so we'll add about another but see i've got loads of plans i don't know which one to even talk about um <laughs> but we, we should double within two years yeah put it that way. I and, and interestingly, we often talk, and you've heard me say this before, growth isn't about, is slow, slow, quick. Yeah. There are so many members that we have said, slow down, fix the basics, put a scalable foundation, work out what you're about, work out, you know, we've, we've had a lot of conversations, haven't we, with that certified growth advisor cohort you're on about how do you make marketing on autopilot? How do you yep. make it just happen? And it, it, it doesn't happen because you spend lots of time out there in the marketplace. It happens because you get the proposition right, really well aligned. You know, all your messages are now aligned to growth. The role of a founder, you talk about yourself as chief legacy maker. You know, you've, you've seeped this whole thing. You haven't done what a lot of people do, which is, right, I'm a trades or a creative specialist. And it's, it's two lines on a website and that's it. You know, fundamentally, if you want to kind of really get that kind of level of growth, you're talking about a grand to three grand of monthly recurring revenue extra each month. You know, that's a, that's a 250, that's 250 plus a year. And I know now that you'll deliver it because what we find is when we get people sustainable and scalable at half a million, you now know that it really is you put your foot down and you enjoy the ride because it will just go really, really quickly. So I'm going to turn this to questions. So what questions have people got for Graham? You know, he will answer them, even if they're like, what was your most excruciating and embarrassing moment? Probably when I shot the golden duck <laughs> and it realised it no longer sold him. But put no, it that wasn't it. That, it was the fact that I just said, by the way, I've done that, that was my best post. That was the most embarrassing bit. <laughs> not the duck. When you wrote up that you'd shot the best duck. <laughs> yeah, it was good. I was like, bloody hell. <laughs> Yeah. No, had, no animals were harmed at the naked of course, just to be clear, just in case it goes out and get the wrong end. It was a plastic duck. Yeah, <laughs> I don't plastic. have a gun, seriously, despite what members of the, of the club may say about some of my style. Yeah. <laughs> um, so while people, I wait for a couple of questions, because I know somebody like Guy, Michael, <laughs> oh, we've got Guy, lovely Guy, one of our founder members. Someone like Guy, Michael, Stephen have all probably got some um, questions for you. Oh, question from Mary. Do you still outsource? And if so, is your team happy about it? Um, okay, so yes, we do. Um, and I actually helped build an outsource team when I was at PwC. It was my job. Um, and being the hypocrite that many business owners are, and I can say that as I am one, it took me years to replicate the same bloody model, and I've got no good reason why. Um, so yes, we recruited the best person for the job, which happened to be through uh, Global Emphasis. Um, in around July, August 2020, and they are still with us today. And it works brilliant. The best advice I'd give to anybody, um, and hopefully I get this right way around, um, if you outsource an offshore, it's just a full-time member of our team. That, that, that's what I'd say. Yeah. So yeah. she's on our website, she's very visible, she's included in all communications, has access to everything, and we do not hide it. And um, we treat her like what we do any other member of the team, including Christmas presents at Christmas, um, and it works an absolute treat. Um, but it was never cost him, it got the best person for the job. And she's introduced and brought things to them we didn't ordinarily have. Reference the point in terms of the team, the team absolutely love her. They were naturally resistant at the time, but those which were resistant um, moved on because they recognised and feared that the errors of their ways would be shown, and they were. Those, they, like I say, she's just like anybody else here now, and the team love her. And the team would embrace. 
anybody else's recruit. But what I would say is when we recruit going forward, will I always outsource offshore? I would never pass one off bits of work, being honest, and um, because I see issues in that. I've seen it before, you lose consistency. But I want the best people for the job, and if that's here in the UK or abroad, I'm not bothered. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting because you know, people in my who know me will know that I've spent a lot of time with uh, GI. There are other good outsourcers out there. We can name others. You know, I'm, I'm no longer, you know, on any kind of commercial relationship with GI. Um, so, so I think there are some key things that you need to think about with outsourcing. One, how do you get the team on board? Because if the team are not on board, they will sabotage it from day one. And I'll tell you how they'll sabotage it. They won't send things over. Two, they will um, over review the stuff that's coming back. Three, they won't communicate properly with the team. And, and then they'll turn around and go, well, it didn't work. The quality was crap. And actually all of those we know happen. So those are part of the things. The other thing is to really think about what you're outsourcing. If you're building the kind of practice that Graham is, which is you are now becoming business advisors first and foremost that happen to do the numbers in the background. Actually, it's so important to hold the dialogue and the relationship with the client. If you then outsource all your bookkeeping, unless it's cleanup work into year end, you are not controlling that conversation. And I always say to people, you've got if you're going to build that advisory led practice, what you've got to do is think of the people in house are almost going to replicate the finance department of any big business use outsourcers for processing volume don't use them for they don't use them in a way that they need to think you're not paying them to think yeah they're great for clean up jobs you know here's a bag of receipts great for that you're not paying them to think and if you're thinking about paying them to think you've got the wrong idea for that so you know the other thing is also this ramp up to outsourcing a lot of us often can't afford a single fixed seat to start with so you've got to take a half seat or a quarter seat, or you've got to go an outsourced route instead of an offshore route. But take it slowly. Always start with year end work. Get comfortable with outsourcing, get the team on board, you know, actually physically move the team's roles and responsibilities to move them away from hanging on to work that should be outsourced. Got loads of questions here. Um, Sarah's asking, hello, Sarah, has having your pricing on your website helped get the right clients? I'm going to be honest, Sarah, I haven't a bloody clue. <laughs> no, no. Um, I'll put it on there. Um, it's one of these things whereby I always track leads in terms of where they actually come from. By having the price in there, has it turned people on, turned people off? Honest answer, I don't know. Um, am I tempted to take it off? Absolutely not. I've been on a journey. I've heard various viewpoints of put it on, take it off, whatever. I'm very neutral. So the honest answer, Sarah, yeah, honestly, I don't have a clue, but I've got no intention of taking it off. I personally think um, it can it be bad because if somebody's put off by the pricing on there, because we're not looking at volume for us personally, that's okay. And if they're not going to spend the time to get to know us a little bit better, well, again, that's probably okay because they're not our ideal client because a lot of stuff which supports what we're about as a firm and it's very easy to be accessible. So people are to invest the time in us to understand what they need, what we're capable of delivering and where that price comes from then that can only add to them making the right decision. If that alone is something to turn them off, then, like I say, it probably doesn't fall within our niche. So, But, yeah, I've got to be honest with being neutral. I don't know. So I'll give the textbook answer. I will say that when you put pricing on the website, the amount of inquiries went down. The quality of the inquiries went up. You had to spend less time pre-qualifying because what you're not doing is getting people going, Graham, can you do me a set of accounts and two tax returns, please? Because you're in a different kind of business. You are not in a compliance factory. Now, we have members who openly run compliance factories, and that's OK. You know, we're not we're not saying that, you know, but your business model is very different. So what people find when they put their pricing is on the website is um, it's a lot easier to get stuff across the line. You've already anchored a price in their mind so they know they're not spending 200 quid a month with Graham. So already we've got we're getting rid of the, you know, the businesses that aren't going to grow. They're up to about 150K that are like, look, I just needed my compliance. But they're not Graham's clients. So pricing is a marketing tool that should be used very carefully and use it well. Actually, it cuts out a huge amount of time wasting. So um, we've got a couple of questions here. So Michael wants to know, 
um because now michael has got you in his sight so that's where he maybe wants to go um are all your fees now monthly recurring and how much are you working in or on the practice now well i've seen one above there as well so i'm going to give michael three three answers yeah so um are all fees now monthly? Yes. And if they don't like it, they don't get signed up. So that's the first one. Am I working the business less than I ever have been? And that's about to be reduced significantly more again um, in terms of that. Because again, I, and the team keep telling me, Green, you need to stop being the face of the business. I said, not a problem. So compliance, I'll take a step back. And the third bit, because I've seen it was a little bit filled with chat. Clarity, how much has that helped your business? If you get a return on it, a massive return. Um, and it's so much more than a handy tool, and it's transformed our mindset and our approach, which best supports our advisory piece. So yeah, transformational uh, with regards to clarity. But again, after get a separate conversation again, away from this yeah. call, but absolutely transformation. But but the key thing with software, and I can give you a generic answer with regards to software, which feeds into Andrew's question here a little bit as well. And again, I learned this through mistakes. No client buys software, they buy solutions. When you start marketing software, you might as well be working on behalf of the software company. What you're doing is ultimately you're trying to find the best clear solution for the business owner when they're coming towards you. So that's what I'm doing with these businesses. So say, for example, a client, we ask you a business, right, where are you? Where do you want to be? How can I help you get there? Right. How I help them get there, they don't care as long as they get there. Their experience to go along the way is ultimately the result. If they have a lovely experience and a lovely time and miss the target, but I said a nice biscuits, nice cup of tea, they don't care. They absolutely don't care about that. If I use Futurely, Clarity, Fathom, but don't use Float, or blah, 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 it doesn't matter. It's all about the end result, which then, which, which yeah, so that's, I know Andrew's got a question, but I'll stay on Michael's for the time being, but that's the answer to Clarity, the fees aren't stepping away. But I do think there's a big, it goes back to the identity piece. I, th I think you've got to kind of build back the identity piece, but make sure it's about the size of your firm. You're not overly light, and you and I can see ego-wise, I'm not bothered if people think of it's me or it's not me. I don't care anymore. Like what I care about is family, friends, and, and good health. And this, I can do that more by not being the face of the firm and I can spend more time with them. And like I said, we'll get further by the team can be the heroes for me. That I don't mind this. If they never even meet us, I'm not bothered. Mm. I'm sorry, because ultimately I can better support my family and that's most important to me. And, and I think there's a really important point here is, don't get me wrong, we like clarity. Our members get a discount on Clarity. It is a great tool to help prompt conversations. Sarah, he still is using Carbon. Our members get a discount on Carbon. We have a number of members using Carbon. It's a great tool. Um, is Clarity is not the cheapest tool out there. And if you're going to go into it, it's got to be part of an overall strategy to where you are supporting where you have a, and I'll use this, where you have a strategy not to become a portfolio FD, where you have a strategy to be seen as a business advisor, first, accountant, second. Because actually, if you don't have, if you are not building within your practice, the skill set to be able to have commercial conversations at a very junior level with clients, there's no point in taking on board something like Clarity. It's a sticking plaster, it's a shiny, expensive tool. It's got the one, there are members that use it and use it really well, are the ones where it's fundamentally core to what they are and what they're about. We have members that, that have used it because it's a shiny toy, and those are the ones that we know will put it down very, very quickly. Um, it's got to be and it works best and you'll fly with it if you see something like clarity is absolutely core cool to what you're doing as a business with your clients. Um, which software did you ditch, by the way? Andrew wants to know, spill the beans. <laughs> uh, well, I'll start with which software I use, then I'll go with software I ditch because I'm not going to be a politician to answer the question. So let's focus on the software I focused on beyond. So um, carbon, ignition, um, zero, Dex Precision, Dex Extract, um, Clarity, Fathom, um, Clar uh, Capitalize, um, Diagnostics, and VFD. They're, those are the core bits of software that we use. The ones we ditched, um, Sage, um, all the other accounting platforms, um, Futurely, um, sorry, HubSpot we use as well for a marketing piece. Um, so yeah, ditched Futurely. I think some of the others we use absolutely loads. Um, Chaser, don't bother with that. Um, we don't bother with that. Pretty much all the rest. 
Yeah, you, you had a lot. And I think I think when it comes to thinking about your software, that there, there are two schools of thought. Well, there are a number of schools of thought, but the first thing to do is how do I run my practice effectively? And that's about an internal viewpoint. So that's very much am I going to am I going to go 100 percent free agent, 100 percent um, zero? And, and this is the first question you've always got to take, because that question fundamentally determines some of the rest of your choices. Because after all, you know, if, if you're going to go sage, auto entry is great. If you're not going to go sage, then auto entry I'm hearing is, you know, maybe not as playing as nicely as it used to do with other platforms. You know, it's like if you're going to go all in on zero, then you've got that brilliant zero tax that can be used. But if you've got some that are not on zero, you're going to have to get a ledger license. and You've got a little bit of an arse in there. So, you know, there's there's a really there's a marketing based decision that then drives the practice software. So you then choose what's going to drive your what I would call getting the client workout software, your practice management system, your tax and account software. Then it really is about actually what is your strategy for delivering value to your clients? You know, what is that strategy? So for yourself, you know, it's very much a growing, about growing business. You do quite a lot with exiting businesses, it's why, which is why you've got VDF Pro. You want all the team to feel equipped to have that conversation with anyone about their business. Hence, clarity is very useful because it gives a structured format for how, you know, people that don't necessarily have 20 years of being a business owner's son and all of this sort of background. So you then pick, right, if, our, if we're going to be helping our clients deliver value with that, you know, if you, then for we're going to need these within our stack. And that's how I would always choose. Whereas what we do often at the moment is you explained it quite nicely. You go to somewhere like Accountex, you go to somewhere, you know, there are other exhibitions. Um, and um, what happens is there's often a very nice person who in exchange for putting in a prize draw, getting a nice pair of socks, lovely water bottle, have a software demo. And then they say to you, look, if you do this right and you buy 50 licenses, I can give you a deal on the day. And by the way, if you do this right, you get 2% of your client, but 10% of your client based on this. But you can do that, can't you? Because you're great. You'll get this amount of money through the door and you go, oh, spreadsheet millionaire. And before you know it, you brought 50 licenses. And then it becomes this millstone around your neck that the clients don't, you know, your team doesn't want it. You don't have the time to do it. And you wondered why you got seduced by a pair of socks and a water bottle. I think something just to go back, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head there with regards to it, but just going back to Andrew's comment that I'm not being disrespectful with regards to those bits of software, but it goes back to those that we ditched. It's about being selfish of where the greatest need is in your business for those clients you support. And mm. I think, again, it goes back to that solution and approach. What's the biggest problem your clients are facing there now for which you can fix and which selfishly is going to make the greatest difference to your business? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And it, it always starts with, what are we delivering for clients? That then drives some of the software. You then get as what you and I would call that internal piece, you know, the DEX, the accounting platform. Of course, it could be DEX, HubDoc, Safe Analytics, all of this sort of stuff. And then once you've got what I would call the delivery of the basics, then you talk, what is, what, what is the greatest pain? What can I solve by that? You know, there are some great pieces of software. I'm just thinking Chaser that you're no longer using because it doesn't match where you take it. <laughs> taking your client so I have to say thank you very much Graham uh, absolutely loved listening to you um oh another one do you do you use pricing software I think you're still on practice ignition ignition yeah we, we're using we use ignition yeah so and again that's a probably a chat in itself because I say I understand the goal proposal bit I'm not even going to begin to start with the comparison between those bits but yes we do but we're very much use a hybrid of approach with regards to pricing and it's uh it's an ongoing challenge, um, which is a work in progress. So I'll, I'll, I'll do the diplomatic version. Go Proposal is the best quoting tool out there if you have the mindset where you want to literally be able to cost out each feature of your service. It's very, very good for that. However, that might not be what your clients want. It might not lead to the kind of conversations you want to have. Do you want to be known as the accountant that's literally nickeling and diming everything or are you using it as a means to demonstrate the value you're giving? 
Um, you look at Ignition, we love Ignition. It's the most flexible engagement tool stroke, um, engagement stroke billing tool. And actually, if it's configured rightly, we'll do a lot of what Go Proposal will do. Now, don't get me wrong, there are people in the club that rave about both of them. They each have their place. They each have their strengths. Hopefully that's, that's um, hopefully, uh, Sarah, so glad we're on the same page, re-ignition, that's good. <laughs> and yes, members of the club get a discount um, on ignition as well. I feel like a software seller here. Don't I? <laughs> Thank you very I'll much, be Graham. I've been there, stop it. I know, thank you very much, Graham. I have to say I was jotting in things and like that's a little clip here, that's a little quote here. I really enjoyed this. So thank you, Graham. Um, if anything, I appreciate your roller coaster because it makes for a great interview. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you everybody for being on. And if anybody needs them, I've got our values. If you just go via Heather, I'll email you our values and things we've yeah. got there. I'm happy to share things among the club so you can have them. Yeah, you are. Let me guess it's Graham. Uh, uh, I'll put it I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, you, you can write it quicker than I can. Graham's just putting his thing in. That sounded wrong. Just putting his email address <laughs> in the chat box. Uh, Guy, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Andrew as well, Sarah. There we are. But yeah, please do connect with Graham. He's a top lad. Um, and I know you're very helpful to many of our members. But thank you very much, Graham. And speak with you, you soon. Bye. Okay, bye.